Amit Chandra is the chairman of Bain Capital in India. He spent the better part of his career at DSP Merrill Lynch, where he quickly became one of India's preeminent bankers. In 2008, he set up Bain Capital's Mumbai office, marking the iconic private equity firm's entry into India. Mr. Chandra is a noted philanthropist, and along with his wife, Arjuna, one of the most active philanthropists in India. He has served on various boards, including that of Tata Sons, Piramal Enterprises, and many non-profits such as Give India and the Akamsha Foundation. I sat down with Mr. Chandra to discuss the India opportunity and how the true potential of the country can be unleashed. Sensei Kujaku. Hi, Amit Bhai. Thanks so much for doing this. Welcome to the Sensei Kujaku show. Thank you. Pleasure being here. So, Amit Bhai, there's a lot I want to cover today. Um, but the, what I really want to start with is everything that's going on in India today and there's so much talk and so much excitement. I want to understand from your perspective, what, what about India and the Indian economy excites you today? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, Krish, I think uh, undoubtedly India right now, s first of all, seems just like an incredibly bright spot uh, in what's a crazy global scenario. I mean, pretty much you got to look at any part of the world right now and things seem to be falling apart. Uh, in some cases, they maybe have hit rock bottom. In some cases, they're on the way to the bottom. And just therefore, from a relative perspective, uh, you know, we can argue whether it's going to be 6.5% growth or 6% growth in the year ahead. Those numbers really look good. Uh, the fact that we don't have, you know, a, a major macro uh, issue at this point of time, uh, despite having, you know, uh, come out of COVID, uh, and having a lot of people at the bottom of the pyramid needing support is actually quite incredible. Um, the world is actually going to pay a pretty big price for that. Most of the world is going to pay a pretty big price for that, uh, as it is for actually the effects of the Russia, Russia, Ukraine crisis. So, on a relative basis, India actually looks pretty good. Sure, on a you know absolute basis, we've had years of much more stronger growth in the past. And uh, but it's you know tough for India to grow at uh, at at its historic levels, uh, some of the peak levels we've seen in the past, when the world economy actually isn't doing well. Because one of our important cylinders, i.e., export growth, is simply not going to fire at the same pace. Um, and I think therefore, you know, six percent plus growth is actually going to look really really good. Uh, you know, if we can sustain it for a few years to come. And, and do you think that the necessary building blocks for India to actually fulfill its potential, do you think those building blocks are in place today? Yeah, Krish, you know, uh, if you really step back and think about it, uh, what are the, those building blocks? First of all, you need a, a really strong government balance sheet. Um, and I think, you know, despite COVID having set the government balance sheet back a little bit, um, the government is committed to repairing that part of it. But on a relative basis, our government balance sheet is actually pretty good shape. Uh, you can see we are in a tough neighborhood where countries are falling, you know, off like nine pins at this point of time. And you can realize that, you know, on a relative basis, we are actually in very good shape. And with oil now having come off, uh, it it's only going to get better. Uh, and so that's the first big building block. The second big building block is actually stable governance and policies. Uh, you know, you, again, when you step back and just look at what has made a lot of countries implode. Um, you know, even developed countries, uh, you know, the banking crisis in the US, for example, is because of policy changes that they made, um, you know, to, you know, pump prime a, a system which is actually working fi fine. Uh, so whether it's developed countries or developing countries having sensible policy making, good governance is actually really important. And we've by and large, had, I would say, pretty good governance and policy making for a reasonable period of time. The third is actually, um, for a country like India, it was always going to be really important to deliver on social spending uh, and social schemes well. And for a long time, that was really tough. But thanks to technology and to digital public goods, We've actually leapfrogged and we are today, I would say, the world's leader in this. We, uh, you know, celebrate this, but I think we still underestimate how powerful a tool, you know, all of this is. Um, 
it is incredibly powerful to have uh, you know a person open a, a, a bank account with you know less than ten dollars and be able to maintain that account to be able to transfer funds from Mumbai to Jharkhand with you know a click of uh, a button on their mobile phones um, you know all of this is really powerful the same when you look at it from virtually sector after sector the fact that we are now sitting on the most sophisticated technologies stack for digital public goods is really really powerful it's I think transforming the way we not just the government conducts its life but the way it impacts the the common man or woman the other thing that I think is pretty remarkable is that we always knew that we had the talent um, and great manifestation of that is the fact that you know quarter of our CEOs plus minus uh, of Silicon Valley CEOs are of Indian origin but you know we were not really making great benefit of this when it came to innovation and entrepreneurship in our own country uh, we now have you know one of the most robust innovation uh, entrepreneurship system in the world and that's all happened in the last 10 years I mean we have 100 plus unicorns you know we barely had any just you know seven or eight years ago uh, we are adding rapidly every year and sure you know funding winter might set us back a little bit but you know if uh, if countries are able to bring use their talent to create fresh opportunities uh, you know to create disruptive systems which actually deliver goods and services better that actually bodes very well for them and that's what we've seen in case of countries like Israel and con countries like the US and countries like even China which you know ultimately that have been cutting edge and I think this is the other big change in my mind in uh, in case of India so when you talk about building blocks I think there's a lot well you know which has come together which we don't fully appreciate for people who visit India after long periods of time like you know after 15 years 10 you know 20 years they step back and say wow is this the same country for folks like us it's a little bit you know we are in there and it's like you know water boiling at a gradual temperature we don't really notice the incremental change every year right and and so things you talk about for example UPI Aadhaar these are sort of you know widely appreciated building blocks and technologies that have been implemented but what are some, in your opinion, some of the less appreciated aspects of the Indian economy? For, for, I mean, just as an example, anecdotally, I know of a number of cases of people who, let's say they went abroad to study and say 20, 25 years back, they would have built their entire career there. And, and all the benefit of that human capital is basically employed in another country. And today, a lot of them are choosing to come back. And even people who've already spent 10, 20 years are choosing to come back. So this sort of reverse brain drain, for instance, which only time will tell what effect it actually has. So like that, are there other yes. underappreciated aspects? Yes, I think that, that is a big example and that's the point I made earlier as well that, you know, the switch in innovation and entrepreneurship in India is probably being underappreciated. I mean, uh, and, uh, you know, even programs like Shark Tank have really fired up the imagination of what individuals can do. Uh, and it's not individuals from wealthy families, privileged folks, you know, people in tier two towns, tier two, three towns are now imagining that they can basically be successful entrepreneurs. I think this is being, un is definitely under, under, underappreciated. I think so. Very, very important thing that, you know, we are not fully appreciating how much of a transformative impact it can have on India. And, and how does that make you feel when you see something like Shark Tank, you see someone from a small town starting a business. How does it make you feel both as an Indian and as someone who himself is uh, so involved in business? How, how does that, how do, how do no, you feel uh, when you see I, that? I feel it's incredible because, uh, you know, at the end of the day, ideas can come from anywhere. We know this. Uh, and if we basically limited people, uh, you know, by virtue of privilege, what schools they went to, uh, what circles they were in, we were really limiting our talent uh, and our full potential. And now suddenly, you know, we are including a vast, a greater multiple of people uh, into the opportunity pool. And I think that actually bodes really, really well. It's also important because all these people are not necessarily going to come to the big towns and build ventures, mm. right? A lot of these ventures are going to get built in the hinterland. 
um, you know, in tier two towns and tier three towns. And that's actually really good because there's only a li finite limit to which, you know, uh, metros can keep growing or even tier one towns can keep growing. And so I think the, the way we imagine growth, it has to be a lot more decentralized and uh, uh, well spread out. I think that uh, is also why this is very important. So you spoke about the tremendous potential in human capital that's available in India and you give the example of some Silicon Valley CEOs. In your experience, both as a banker, as an investor and just generally doing business in India, what, what have you seen that separates the great from the good when it comes to doing business? And, and have there been cases where you know you meet someone or you interact with someone and you think this guy is really out of the ordinary? Like, this, I mean, I've met a lot of good business people, but this guy is really something special. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, look, you will always meet people who are, you know, extraordinarily smart and they will impress the heck out of you in a meeting. But I think what you realize is to build, you know, businesses that are enduring, uh, you know, you need to be a little bit of a marathon runner. And, uh, what you realize is that therefore it's important to not just be wowed in that first meeting but to understand whether a person you know is a sprinter or a marathon runner and therefore i think you have to look beyond that smarts you know you ask that you know when you meet someone you get wowed of course you have the tendency you get wowed but i think it's important to look beyond that does the person have a good value system okay does that person have the ability to persevere, which is incredibly important as an entrepreneur because you may have many bad years before you have a good year, okay? When you have, and you need to be able to therefore drive in, uh, you know, a, 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 a you know, low gear before you get into a high gear and then suddenly make the most of it. Um, you know, do you have great EQ skills, which, because no business, can really get built without having good team skills, uh, you know, without putting together a team around you which buys into your purpose and buys into your vision. We've seen so many examples of people basically just falling apart, be it with their team or be it with their investors, mm -hmm. right? And some of these things get really acrimonious. So I, I think what you realize is that you need to really go beyond those first meetings where someone's content and idea and uh, even ex immediate execution abilities wow you. And you need to look for all of this and be able to see whether this person can run the marathon using all these skills. So I, I just want to take you back to something you had said in one of your early answers, um, which was the importance of manufacturing and building that sort of export base in a country. And if you look historically, countries that have really taken the kind of leap that India is hoping to take over the next 10 or 20 years, a large part of that has come from building a manufacturing base and, and more than manufacturing, exporting base because the whole point is the minute you export, you can be a multiple of your domestic self. Yeah. So do you sense that India is taking the, I mean, and I use India as a, the Indian economy and everyone together, is that we are on the right path and we're doing the right things in that regard? Yeah. Yeah, no, I think this is a very important question. Look, I think India really suffered because of the lack of focus on building its manufacturing capabilities. And there were a lot of contributing reasons uh, towards that. Ease of doing business in our country historically has been abysmal. Um, maybe some states are better than others, but uh, even our best state, you know, doing business in our best state compared to doing business in Vietnam or Thailand or Malaysia or forget South Korea, Japan is just, you know, Zamin Asman Kaparak. Um, if you look at cost of power, uh, you know, that if you're a power intensive industry that lands up holding you back. Uh, you know, we've historically not thought about capital subsidies where some businesses needed to be set up. We've not, you know, thought about, you know, the right policy frameworks to make sure that some segments get off the ground and then you can take the wheels off and let them survive and as a consequence many of our uh, you know competitors by, by competitors i mean econ economies have gone and taken the lead in in these areas 
um, and we are paying the price for that today. And, are, and COVID actually showed us and showed the world that that's a pretty heavy price, you know, which is why the whole Atmanirbhar Bharat concept is actually a very sensible concept, not just for India uh, itself, but also for other countries to think about how India can be a more important manufacturing base. Um, I think that in the next five years, you will actually see a transformative impact of these policies play out on the ground. Um, we are still underestimating how this will happen. Um, I think we will. We may not get the PLI scheme perfect. Uh, I think there will be some areas where it will work well, some areas where it will not work well, and you know, uh, time will tell where what what exactly happens where. But overall, I think the fact that we've had a you know big 13, 14 sectors getting covered, at least in some sectors, I think we will make progress as a consequence to which our share of manufacturing globally will improve there because supply chains will move uh, you know, here. And importantly, what we are importing uh, may actually reduce there. And so I think the impact of both those will get felt. I think defense industry will have a transformative change because what we will manufacture in India, given our defenses requirements are so large, for India will will actually have a big impact on the economy. So I think those two things will have a big, big change in the next four, five years. The third area where change is already happening, and I want to go back to a question you asked earlier, is that what we are not fully realizing is that service exports, mm -hmm. even through COVID, have been growing really strong. Mm -hmm. Historically, when we used to think of service exports, we used to just think of you know diamonds and stuff like that. It's obviously changed now. India has truly become the back office to the world. So if you look at all the large financial services firms, through COVID, they've all rapidly expanded their back offices in India. Mm. Uh, most of the big world, you know, banks in the world are now 2x to 3x the talent pool um, compared to three years or four years ago. Mm. And you can see this in the service export numbers actually go up. So I think when you bring this all together, um, and I would add one more area of great opportunity, which is I think India has actually a, a incredible opportunity to increase its share of um, agri-exports to the world. Uh, very few countries have that, that ability in terms of scale. Uh, we need to do a bunch of things to invest, uh, to improve uh, our ability to do that, which I think you know, we will hopefully over the next four or five years. When you bring all of this together, I think our share of, of you know, global trade, which is minuscule at this point of time, can only keep going up. It has actually gone up in the last, last two years. But I think it can only go up from here. And importantly, our import intensity in the economy will actually come down. So th those, uh, it's interesting, those shackles that have sort of held us back that you mentioned, you know, things like bureaucracy, red tape, corruption, etc. If you compare the start of your career, like India when it was at the start of your career versus where it is today, do you see, I mean, what sort of change do you see on those aspects and, and do you think the shackles are off? No, the shackles are far from off and I think the policymakers know that and the senior level they know that. I think big corruption has massively reduced. Mm. I think uh, mid to small corruption is still highly prevalent. Mm. Um, and I think for that to happen, even policymakers understand that what you really need to do is take a machete and cut uh, regulations down massively because those are essentially rent seeking devices. Uh, we still have way too many laws governing how we do work. And you need far too, you know, fewer laws and uh, the laws need a lot less, uh, you know, ambiguity in them. Uh, because you know, the more ambiguity there is, the more leeway provides uh, uh, any person who wants to misuse them to go after uh, you know people who want, want to do business and the common person on the ground as well, right? Uh, and so I think what you need is really for India, I would say, for from a tenure perspective, ease of doing business and ease of living needs to dramatically improve. And for that to happen, you need to vastly simplify and uh, uh, cut the, you know, the legal um, 
burden that people basically face. And and do you think that governments, both local, state, federal, are are receptive? I think they understand. I think fully understand that. I think the receptivity is different in different states. Um, I think the political will is again different in different states. I think the central government understands it and wants to do uh, things. But I I would still say that this is one area where you need much much more rapid focus. Yeah. But but if you if you had to summarize it, would you say that over the course of your career, India has become a cleaner? I, I mean, uh, yes, that, no, no doubt about that. I mean, yeah. all of us who yeah. lived through the you know uh, in the eighties, I, I was a college student, but uh, I started working in in the early early nineties. And if you can if you see what it was from then to now, and you see how you access government services, how you interact with government agencies, is there a big difference? Yes. Could there be a bigger difference? Yes. This is all. You're never satisfied with change, right? And I think uh, technology provides us the opportunity to, you know, make much more faster change than we have. Uh, but I think the single biggest way to bring this change in my mind is, I think the government just stepped back and said, we will eliminate sixty percent or fifty percent of laws. I can tell you nothing will happen. The country will only get far better. Everybody knows this. Okay, I mean, uh, many of our laws are from you know 19th century and uh, and are completely ridiculous and stupid, right? So I think you know we just need it will improve the ability of the regulators to re- regulate the uh, you know uh, policy makers to uh, put new policies in. So they just need to go after. Uh, you know all these things that improve ease of living and ease of doing business. Right, and and so it's interesting that you bring up the concept of ease of doing business. Of course, you know talked about a lot, and everyone constantly thinks about that. But a large part of growing as an economy and making it an inclusive economy where everyone across the pyramid benefits is improving the day-to-day life of the people who may not have the resources that other people have. And so I, I want to talk, and because you play such an active role on that side as well. I want to talk to you about how we can use the lessons from capitalism and business and apply them to the social sector of philanthropy and all of that, and to improve that side of things. So, so do you think that a more business-like approach to I don't want to say just giving, but philanthropy as a whole is required? And and do you think that we're actually moving in that direction already? Yeah. So you know, Krish, I personally feel that it's. The world of whether it's the world of business or it's the world of social services, and because I think philanthropy is a very small part. Remember of social services, if you look at total philanthropic spending, it is less than two percent of all social spending. Ninety-eight uh, percent is the government at the end of the day. So, if I just look at that whole universe, I have a f- my own sense is that everybody has an opportunity to learn from each other. It's the government is not perfect. The corporate corporations are also far from perfect, and philanthropy is very nascent. It may have existed in our, you know, in our DNA and all of that, but in scale, mm-hmm. it's still very nascent. So, if you really step back and say that any one of these is perfect and can like teach the other one, I don't think that's true. Okay, I feel, however, there may be best of best in class things that each one of these people do, which the other can actually learn from. And we have to really step back and think of what are those things that you know we can pick from one place, and also what, from a DNA perspective, one segment is better, you know, uh, inherited to do, which it can then, you know, uh, transfer to the other. Okay, and l- let me let me explain what I mean by that. So I think, for example, the social sector has great sense of purpose. I mean, if you think about people working for a fraction of the salary that they would get in the corporate world, okay, not sitting in fancy offices, being on the field, uh, trying to change the world, dealing with very tough problems than simply creating profit. Why do people do that, right? They could do other things with their life. They do that basically because. They ingrain with a deep sense of purpose that they want to improve society for everybody, be it in 
the government, be it in the corporate world, their neighbor, up or down or wherever, right? That sense of purpose, in my mind, is something everybody can learn from. Okay, the corporate world can certainly learn from the sense of purpose because, you know, people move jobs every, you know, few few years, sometimes even quicker. In the government, people are guaranteed their jobs, but often, you know, bureaucrats complain that people are not giving that kind of commitment and, you know, it's tough to extract, uh, you know, you know, uh, 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 fully from, from their potential. So I think that sense of purpose is actually something we can learn from the social sector. If you look at gov- the, the business world, I think what we realize is that it's a well-oiled machine from point of view of a few things, right? Because capital is very clear, it seeks, ve- you know, uh, 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 accountability for from a returns perspective. Um, that system has got perfected over, it's not fully perfect, but it's got at least close to perfected over a long period of time. I think that system of measurement, evaluation, the feedback loop on the accountability that that results in, I think is something that everybody can learn from. Okay. Uh, Be it in the government, be it in the social sector, okay? We can all benefit from how do we, you know, set better targets? How do we measure against those targets? How do we hold people more accountable for those, uh, for those objectives that was commonly set, okay? And then even if we, our incentive systems may be more suited to the, you know, if we are in the government, to the government system, to the social sector, if we are in the social uh, services area, but at least we figure out what we do with whatever that data is telling us. So I think that's an area we can definitely learn from, you know, from, from the, from the business world. I actually think that when it comes to uh, scale, because the philanthropic area has never rarely worked at scale. Okay. Very few organizations have budgets greater than, you know, hundred crores. You can probably put them on an Excel sheet with, you know, less than a hundred uh, rows in it, right? Um, there, in my mind, I think you can learn a lot from both the government, mm-hmm. which has the ability at a click of a button to go and implement a program in 700 districts and, you know, every state of the country impacting hundreds of millions of people. Or in some cases, the large corporations who can do the same thing with the launch of a product. So I think how to handle scale is something that the social sector can learn. How to innovate, okay. Now this is a very important area. Very little innovation happens in the large businesses. No innovation happens in the government with few exceptions, which we have seen last few years, the digital public goods being a great example for it. But even that got seeded by a separate group of people doing things. So innovation, what we are learning needs a particular environment, okay. In my mind, that uh, for that innovation, which is critical to solve, you know, really tricky problems, be it in the government or be it in social services or whatever, you need, you know, to bring in a certain kind of people who have the ability to swing and miss. Mm -hmm. They are not afraid to fail, Uh, you know, and that in my mind, I think we need to probably do that in the philanthropic sector. The philanthropic sector takes very little risk, which is a big mistake. But I think we can take those risks in the philanthropic sector. If it works, we can then embed it into government programs, right? Uh, In the business area, we have now managed to create this parallel system where if it's working, then it gets funded by the large people. Same thing we need to do in the philanthropic sector. And so if you think about outcomes in the philanthropic sector as a sort of two by two matrix where you have the odds or certainty of success on one end and um, that's called the, the impact that you have. So now obviously you want to avoid low, low and everyone wants high, high, but the ground reality is you're somewhere between high, low and low, high. And do you, do you get the sense that people are more likely to go do something that has a low impact but very high odds of success? And how do you push people to actually go the other way and say that, look, it's okay if you fail, but in case you succeed, the impact is so fantastic, it's worth the risk. Yeah, no, I absolutely. I think, you know, 
unfortunately what has landed up happening is that a lot of philanthropy is essentially going towards doing things that the government is already doing okay and what we are therefore not fully appreciating is that in the overall scheme of things okay will we land up actually solving a problem we really want okay i mean if the government is going to build toilets okay and we go out and we spend a little bit of the csr money and the philanthropic money we have to build more toilets will sanitation really be impacted will disease incidents really change the answer is really no okay so i think we need a mindset change uh, you know where people basically figure out that okay you know i will do things that the government doesn't do okay because look governments are big huge machines when you work with a heavy hand you know there are always corners in the house that get missed out now that is where civil society and uh, uh, you know philanthropy can be very very valuable right there will be folks who causes that will be excluded folks who will be excluded and you can say i will come and fill in those gaps right or you say that okay going back to the example of you know uh trying to solve the sanitation problem i will actually find more disruptive ways to fuck to solve the sanitation problem like experiment with all of that using my money and it doesn't matter whether my project fails or succeeds or whatever but if it succeeds even if the odds are 20% or 30% right at least it could have resulted in the government basically cutting its cost by 30 or 40% because imagine a government program which has you know 5000 crores or 10000 crores being spent every year and you spend you know 20 crores but that 20 crores helps you basically cut 30% from a government's program look at the roi that you have so i think we need people to basically say that okay you know what when i publish my report i will say that i did this program and it didn't matter that it failed because that if i'm a venture capitalist i don't care about the fact that you know 60% 70% of my portfolio are done what i really care about the fact that you know what which are the ones which have been successful and so i will basically say that i tried this project and this is why it basically failed publish those failures so that somebody else doesn't repeat them right but collectively by choosing this kind of an approach we will actually then go out and you know this 500 billion dollar of social spending that the government is doing we will maybe you know figure out a way how to you know make it 30% more effective which means unlock 150 billion dollars of it using the 3 billion that we are spending and so the return on it will be 50x because otherwise by the 3 billion even if we spend it better than the government is spending how much what will be the impact yeah. 6 billion 8 billion 10 billion it's still 2% of government spending it has no impact so so in in the social sector do you find that there are areas that have a much larger multiplier effect so for example if you take the things that we spoke about instead of targeting sanitation if you target education it in some ways also impacts sanitation no krish i think i i don't think that you need to necessarily make sectoral choices um to you know get to that kind of an answer i think pretty pretty much in any area uh you could basically go out and find a more innovative disruptive way to get to a be- you know better policy outcome okay or better program outcome um in fact historically a lot of the money has gone towards you know education uh, health and, uh, and and livelihoods three those three areas definitely those are three areas where i think if you focus a lot on these areas you will solve for a lot of other things uh, you know in social spending so undoubtedly finding better ways to deliver on these three i think is really really important i personally feel that another area that requires a lot of focus and attention is you know uh, farmers 
uh, because you know 50% of the population is there, a lot of our spending is there. If we can just get, you know, we can find ways to, you know, have better practices, uh, you know, uh, better direction of, of government spending, uh, you know, improve income, you will lift a lot, a lot of boats, right? So I think you don't need to, and the, my, my answer to your question is you don't need to necessarily get completely confined to just education I help, which is what a lot of people have got. There's opportunities, in my mind, to work quite broadly. Uh, but certainly I think you, you know, 80, 20 of it lands up being in four or five areas. I want to understand how you think about motivations and incentives in this space. Um, it's obviously great if everyone does all these things and gives money and their time and energy for the right reasons. But as a society as a whole, should we be upset if a billionaire cuts a check, opens up a school for underprivileged kids just so that he can put his name on a building and get society's applause? Should we be should we care that should we care about his motivations or no. just think of the outcome? No, I think we should not look at ultimately each person who has money will do things with their money in my mind should do things with their money which makes them feel satisfied and happy mm. okay uh, I mean I personally do the things that I do because it makes my wife and me happy all right now if in the course of doing things you really feel that you know you need your name on the door of a school that's okay you know I mean that's your personal choice I mean I we may not have put our name on the door of a school but that that's a personal choice, right? I mean, I think each person should make their choice. I personally feel to the point of motivation that you that you said, look, different people can have different motivations. My motivation for doing this is very clear that I believe with whatever I'm blessed with, be it, you know, uh, position in society, be it the little bit of wealth that we generate from, from uh, you know, the, the, the job I've had, uh, you know, or be the network that I possess that there's a great sense of satisfaction that comes from being able to, you know, put that to use for greater good of society. Mm -hmm. That's a very selfish objective, mm -hmm. which is personal satisfaction. I may get that satisfaction building the next business, but I built two businesses and I don't necessarily think it's going to give me the high doing it, you know, the third time. And so I do what I do because it makes me really happy. So in my mind, I think solving for what makes you happy is actually really important. The other motivation which I've, I think is also important is that, look, you know, we all think about what we want to give our kids and in general, the next generation. We are in fact obsessed about it. We know very well that the wealth that we create cannot transfer, uh, you know, to us in our next lifetime. Some people believe it might, but most logical people don't believe it can. So we obsess a lot with how much wealth we can, you know, give to our next generation. I believe that we have to think about that wealth a little bit holistically, right? If we think of that wealth also in terms of the world that we're going to leave for the next generation, right? The, I mean, the world that we were born into was a world with much better environment uh, you know it was a you know world where you could breathe the air that you know you woke up every morning and opened your your window to um, and but it had a lot of other imperfections absolute poverty was much higher and so when you think about what our generation has done it has done a good job with some things but it's done a really bad job with others mm -hmm. right and so I look at it as an opportunity that I don't want to leave my, the, for the next generation, including my daughter with at least, you know, just some amount of money. I have to think more holistically about what I've done uh, to leave her with a better world and what my contribution towards that is. I think each person has an opportunity to think about what their contribution to the world is that they want to leave behind for the next generation. Yeah. It's, it's like Buffett says, right? when people ask him about what he's going to do with his money and why he, whether he's going to leave it to his kids, he would always say that, I want to leave them enough that they can do whatever they want, but not so much that they can do nothing. Yeah, if you're, you look, if your kid needs a lot, 
in any case, it means that you're already in trouble at that point of time. So, I think you know, uh, I think most uh, most good kids don't really need a lot of lot of your money. And and in some ways, isn't the most selfish thing you can do is to actually leave a better world rather than you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, absolutely correct. I actually feel that again, it's both from a satisfaction point of view, and if you really care about your next gen, including you your immediate progeny the most not just selfish but the most satisfying thing you can do is leave them a better world a world which has got less hate a world which has got a better environment where you know many of the problems have got you know sorted out um, it and it still won't be perfect and they will have to work on you know improving on things that you would have done but i think what whatever you could have done to to the best of your ability as opposed to make it worse our generation has, you know, done a really bad job with climate change. We may have done a good job with poverty with, uh, alleviation, but I think whatever we can now do on climate change, for example, I think is really, really important. And so the last question I have on this topic is actually on um, a foundation that's obviously very well known globally, which is the Gates Foundation. And, and the two people who are driving it, one purely in terms of, you know, his contributions and one actually on the ground. So Warren Buffett and Bill Gates. If you look at what they've done, do you do you think that they have set a model that other people can replicate, or do you think that what they've done is so fantastic that you know I mean you're going to need enough of Bill Gates and Warren Buffett to do? You know that's a great question. I'm a big fan of what uh, you know they've done. I met with Bill just uh, two weeks ago when he was here uh, and I had the opportunity to interact with him. You can see there's a photo of me interviewing them <laughs> in, in, from one of his earlier trips to India. Um, I think people think that what they have done is somewhat unique. Uh, it's very admirable, and it's but it's not unique, and that I think is important to understand because that answers your question. Mm -hmm. One of my icons is a man called Chuck Feeney, mm -hmm. who set up an organization called the Atlantic Philanthropies. Um, which you know, whose money used to be managed, managed by a very well-known private equity firm called General Atlantic. Uh, he was the founder of Duty Free Stores. He gave away eight billion dollars, or about ninety-nine percent of his wealth, during his lifetime. Right? Became a role model for people like Bill and Warren Buffett, and even you know, professionals like me. Right? And so people like him have existed. It's just that we haven't. They haven't been. You know boardroom and bedroom common uh, you know stories that people have shared of course we know about the Carnegie's and Rockefeller's but then we forget about Jamshedji Tata and Dorabji Tata I mean you know they have exi existed in our ethos for many years and why look very far as in Premji exists during our lifetime so can this model exist where people create extraordinary amount of wealth point number one point number two then think that most of this wealth should actually be used for greater good and point number three set up vehicles where actually this can be done in a very thoughtful way um, and you actually begin to see impact of some of that I think the answer is yes there are enough examples of this there are examples from the West, there are examples from the East, and I personally feel that there is no reason why people should feel that any of these people are exceptions. Mm -hmm. There are professionals like us, like Ashish Dhawan is doing it in India. Uh, there are professionals who can do it. There are wealth creators who can do it. You can have a billion dollars and do it, and you can have ten billion dollars and do it. I personally feel it's a mindset issue. Okay, and 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 so let's take the example of Chuck Feeney and in his book he had, I mean it's the phenomenal life that he led, and he's somewhat extreme in the sense that I mean it's tough to get people to give away everything. But but do you think that the people who actually create the wealth are maybe counterintuitively more likely to give give it away than maybe say the second or third generation? And and so do you think that something like the giving pledge is important? I don't want to call it intervention, but an important step to go after the people who've actually built it to give it away. Yes, I do think it's inheritors 
uh, may find it more challenging to give wealth than uh, creators, mainly because I think they f uh, might, I think, feel that they are custodians of that wealth, uh, and that therefore they have a duty to kind of, you know, uh, preserve it and pass it on to the next generation. That might might be an issue, um, and so it's not, you know. It's not that they're trying to, you know, be miserly or something about it, but it just may just be that yeah, ethos that, look, it's come to us from someone and we have to therefore pass it on and preserve it. And I think that sense of trusteeship may be a little bit of an issue. And unless, therefore, the creator of the wealth, specifically like in the case of Tata's, where it's very interesting that, you know, the wealth got created, went into a, a charitable trust, and then the Tata's continued to be engaged with it. I think that... If that model gets created, I think it, it's different. But since that model doesn't get created in most cases, the wealth moves from generation to generation. But I think it is much easier with first generation wealth creators to take that call during their lifetime. No doubt about it. And so I'm, I'm going to end with a question that actually is somewhat you know separate and disparate from anything we've discussed. And I want to talk about the importance of reputation and goodwill in life. Now, I, if I take your example, the two industries that you have, you know, banking and, and uh, sort of private equity, if you take not so much in India, but in the West, they have, let's call them mixed reputations. And, but I look, at, I look at someone like you who's gone through both those and, you know, I mean, no one has anything but good things to say about you. So how, how do you, and when I say you, I mean, how does anybody ensure that throughout life that you do what's right, do you do what's correct? And, and you maintain a good reputation. See, everyone wants to do it. The problem is how do you actually implement it? <laughs> you know, Krish, uh, one of my mentors, Hemendra Kothari, uh, told me something very early on when I joined uh, DSP, when I was at DSP Merrill Lynch. And, uh, you know, he called me in and he, he told me in his, in, his, uh, in his unique fashion uh, that, you know, what will be most uh, valuable to you? Um, so I asked him what. He said, you're asleep. So I, I, you know, I was young and I couldn't quite appreciate what, what he was saying. Uh, and then he went on to elaborate. He said, you know, whatever you do, make sure that you're able to sleep well at night. Um, you know, banking uh, was evolving as an industry in the 90s. Uh, you know, you could easily get tempted and, and do things for either personal benefit or for the benefit of your company, uh, which meant you would shortchange either a customer or you would shortchange yourself. I think having that kind of shaping advice early on was very valuable. I can't think of an instance where we ever didn't think of customer first and uh, personally compromised on uh, our own value system. Uh, Despite the fact that we were never the best paymasters, uh, DSP wasn't and you know, all of us had temptations to join someone else where the value system may not have been the same as DSP. But I think it was great because you know, when you got out of DSP, you had a really good reputation, everyone re respected you and you had an incredibly good network. Um, and so, you know, I, I remember him also telling me at some point of time uh, during you know, during my career that, look, never chase money in life. Uh, if you don't chase money in life, money will chase you. And I think it was actually very wise, that advice was also very wise. The simple things like that that I learned early on, uh, which I think stood me in, you know, in good stead. Um, I think also it, at some point of time, I realized that the things that you want to focus on in life, often we land up overemphasizing on you know, just mindlessly focusing on building our careers. It's important to focus on building careers and all of that, but it's really also important to focus on building yourself, um, on building your friends' uh, network. Uh, you know, these are things that will last a lot longer than your career will last. Um, and, you know, these are things that really matter. Your friends are able to look through you. Um, and you know you build the right kind of friends if you do the right kind of things, and you with them you stand by them through ups and downs. Uh, and so, if you really want to look at life as a marathon again, uh, you know you realize that your job 
is going to last you much shorter than your life is in most 99% of cases. So I think uh, you then land up uh, doing the right thing as a person, uh, whether it be for a client or whether it be for an individual who's working for you as an employee or whether it be for a, just any other relationship. And I think all of this ultimately, even if you land up taking tough decisions which piss off people at points of time, over the long term it lands up standing you in good stead. And when you when you look back at your life and career, what is the overwhelming feeling? Is it satisfaction? Is it gratitude? Or is it something else? A lot of gratitude. I have a lot of gratitude because I'm a reasonably, uh, you know, I would say reasonably mediocre guy. <laughs> you know, I know. I my, know about that. I know. <laughs> my, I know my limitations. Uh, but I, I, you know, I've, uh, I've always seized opportunities and made the most of them with a combination of of perseverance, a good value system, a lot of support from uh, you know my family and my uh, my mentors, and uh, and that has helped me get to where I am through ups and downs. Uh, so I have a lot of lot of gratitude uh, for for you know where I am at this point of time in my life. Uh, satisfaction, I don't think I am a person who has never been satisfied, but I have creative dissatisfaction. Um, I set, I look at life in in as a journey as much as a destination, um, and what I mean by that is that I never think of myself as that I want to be the best banker through my life or the best investor through my life. I'm very clear that I want to do different things, build muscle and enjoy each phase of, of, a, of a long journey. And so at the peak of my career as a banker, I decided to leave banking, much against the advice of all my mentors. And I was probably one of the best bankers in the country at that time, but I left banking at the peak and I decided to learn private equity. I knew f- fully well that I may be, may be a completely unsuccessful private equity investor. But it was important for me to do that because I got to a stage where banking came to me too easy. And I felt that if I didn't do something else, I was I would not, you know, build new muscle and I was just not enjoying banking as much anymore. And so I, you know, got into private equity. Five years ago, I handed over day-to-day running to, uh, to my colleague Pavan, who now, you know, runs it. And so that's giving me the chance to basically think about new things, including you know, focusing more on the social sector. I'm thinking, okay, what does the next 10 or 15 years look like? So for me, uh, you know, this creative dissatisfaction, uh, which is thinking about what else I can do uh, to grow as an individual and to contribute more as an individual, I think is always very important. Uh, It does unnerve people around me a little bit because they see that sense of dissatisfaction in me uh, from time to time. I try to use it constructively. Well, Amit, this was absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you. My pleasure. We have time for one more quick question Uh, right here. Hi, Elizabeth Gore, resident entrepreneur at the United Nations Foundation. Um, We admire so much your legacy in philanthropy and your children's philanthropy. I'd love to just hear your philosophy around that. Well, my friend Charlie said, uh, gave away some money the other day, he says, it won't do me much good where I'm going. You know? So, the, you know, I've got everything in life I want. And, uh, you know, it uses a very tiny percentage of my resources. So I have a, some stock certificates that I bought 40 or 50 years ago down in a safe deposit box. And they have no utility to me. They, they can't buy anything from me that I, that I need or want. I mean, uh, I can go down and fondle them occasionally or something of the sort. But, but other than that, they're just pieces of paper. They have enormous utility for other people, you know, and particularly if used wisely. They have no utility for me. So why in the world should I sit there and, and let them sit in a box? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I have never given away a penny that has affected my life in any way, shape, or form. There's people that this Sunday will drop $5 into a collection plate and it makes the difference between whether they go out for dinner or something or go to a movie. Uh, I've never done any of that. But if you have this incredible surplus, and in our giving pledge, we, we, we call these, we only call on people with a billion, you know, and I'm only asking for half, so I, 
I said to my, when they turned me down, I say, you know, I'm going to write a book on how to live on 500 million because there's apparently a big need for this. <laughs> 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 I, 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 I found I could live on 500 million. So I, all the rest, and a lot less, and all the rest is surplus. And why not do, you know, if it can provide vaccines or education or whatever it may be, or a better life for women, I mean, why not use it? I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon. Thanks for watching.